that will help me to walk closer to you. Teach me something tonight, dear Father, that will make the time that, that they spent being here will encourage and edify them. I am honored each time I'm given a chance to communicate to this, to this family. And I'm so grateful for the grace that this ministry has taught that has given us the privilege of living free from the scams and the games that people play and free from the legalism and the dead-end streets of theology so that we can have blessing and freedom in Christ. I want to thank you for that, Father. So bless this night. Make it count in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're ready to write, I want to give you a list of eight things that I have learned from a book of the <clears throat> that organization that uh, ministers to the, uh, the, the believers across the country who are in harm's way. Uh, the Voice of the Martyrs. They put out a book years ago called Heroic Faith. And I loved it so much that I decided to memorize it, and I'm kind of glad because it's no longer in print. But what they did, they did a study of the lives of so many of the people out there who live every day in harm's way. And they made this list because this is what they considered to be heroic faith in a Christian's life, the priorities of life. And I have enjoyed not just the book, but I have enjoyed the privilege of being able to teach this. And uh, it challenges, obviously, me first. By the way, the one thing I love to do when I have a sheet of paper and I'm taking notes, I write at the top, still free. We're still free. And we, sh and we don't deserve to be. But I want to give you the list, and then we'll go back and put, some, put something together on it. The number one factor that they concluded was these people lived in the light of eternity. You see, when you live in the light of eternity, you begin to realize all the things we do in our Christian life ultimately is going to take us to the one place that it's all going to either be blessing and I don't think much cursing. Everything comes to us on the basis of what do you plan to say, what do you plan to do when you're standing eyeball to eyeball with the Savior. I love that group that did that song, uh, <clears throat> I can only imagine. Standing in front of the Savior, what would you do? What would you think? What would you say? They lived in the light of eternity. My attitude is, if I'm standing in front of the Savior and He smiles, I'm okay. I can live with that. Number two, they believed that Jesus Christ was sufficient for their needs in life. And they live by faith. I love this one. I love that one because if you've ever studied under George Mueller, the story of that, that phenomenal man in England when he had thousands of kids in orphanages, and he believed that whatever problem the, they, they were having, to bring it to him, and he would say thank you, and he would get on his knees and bring it to the Savior. And he never raised money. He never asked for money. He never asked for anything but prayer. And I've learned a lot from him because that's my policy. I do not raise funds. I do not ask for money. I never bring it up. I simply say I thank you people for your prayers and your grace because I believe 
if you're doing the will of God, you're doing His will His way, it will never lack His support. I'm amazed when I look at Christendom today and I see all these organizations that are using all these gimmicks. Yes, somebody just gave us a half a million dollars, so now your gift will double. I don't know. I don't understand that. You don't do it because there's a gimmick. Oh, if I give now uh, because of this sum of money that somebody gave them, guess what? It's doubled. Does somebody have to give them a lot of money just to get it doubled? It's going to be doubled and tripled and quadrupled if you gave it as unto him. These gimmicks am amaze me. Well, I've decided that uh, after 38 years of being on the, this ministry I have now with youth across the country, I've never had to coerce, I've never had to ask, i never had to bring up the idea that there was finances that I needed, I would go to the king. And they believed that. They believed it enough to live by faith alone in Christ. They knew that their mission was wrapped up in their love and devotion for the work of Christ in their life, and they realized, I don't have to ask anybody but him. And when you have that attitude, that's what living by faith really is. The third thing that they live by, they believed that the Word of God was their greatest weapon, and they not just studied it continually, they begin to memorize it because many of these fine saints are going to end up in some prison somewhere and they're not going to have access to a Bible because they've learned a great thing. It's not the Bible you carry. It's the Bible that carries us. And by the way, the only Bible you and I own tonight are, are the verses and the promises and the stories of Scripture which we put up here because your only Bible is here. Everything we have physically could be taken away. And this last administration was about to try to do that, so we're anxious to see what's going to happen here. They, they loved to study the Word of God. They were so proud to be students of Scripture. And they didn't waste time, man. They, they studied it. They put it in their souls so they would never forget it. I read one occasion in Russia where they were having an underground Bible study and they were having a prayer meeting and two Russian soldiers came in with AKs and said, we know what you're doing, it's illegal, and I'm going to give you five minutes to make up your mind. If you want to live another night, then get out of this room. And the rest of you, I'm going to find out how you die. Well, strange enough, there was believers who actually left the room. And the soldiers locked the door and said, by the way, we are also Christians, but we wanted to be sure these people that would left here, we could trust. So let's have, let's have a Bible study. That's a tough, that's a tough uh, circumstance, isn't it? It's the word of God up here. Four. <clears throat> they were known as people of great courage. They could face some of the most difficult tests of life and drive on. They had such courage. Of course, what is courage? It's confidence in, in the character of God. Our hope and our strength is wrapped up in who and what Jesus Christ is. I remember back in Texas when I was ordained back in 78, when I got out of the Army in 77. I went to the ordination there at uh, that church, of course. And they had a, they had a written uh, exam, and then they had a public exam. And so on a Saturday morning or Saturday afternoon, we, were, we would be... Uh, <coughs> We'd be tested by the old man. He brought his big chair, and he's sitting there, you know. And so he would ask us questions. It was a public interrogation to see if we could answer under pressure. 
And he asked this one guy who was a missionary to uh, Mexico. I think he was a Korean vet too. They asked him, the, he asked him, he said, uh, I can't think of his name, it'll come to me later. Uh, give me a characteristic of the, uh, of the uh, one of the characteristics of Almighty God. He said, God has a sense of humor. And he wasn't laughing. And the colonel smiled and the rest of us smiled. And we said, is that a, uh, uh, is that a, 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 a <clears throat> Is that a characteristic, uh, is that an absolute characteristic or uh, what is it? Relative. Relative, yes, relative. And he looked back and said, I think God absolutely had a sense of humor. And we all laughed at that point because we realized he's not there to show us how dumb we really are. But uh, I always get a smile out of that one. <clears throat> they had great courage. Five, they lived with the attitude of never give up, never surrender. There was no such thing as, well, I'm going to quit. They didn't have it in their, their agenda. You'd ask them, what are you going to do when you can't do, continue to do this? And they said, we have no idea. Because we're hoping that it'll never stop till Jesus comes back. They had the attitude that I'm sure Ron and I have. That I can't find in scripture where we uh, retire. As long as we can communicate. As long as we can stand or, or stretch or lean on something. As long as we have the ability to do that. Why would we quit? Why would we retire? They didn't have any part of their agenda about giving up or quitting when life got tough. Like one of them ran to this guy and said, man, what's it like back in your life, man, when you hear all this Satan stuff and all this rotten attitude? and <clears throat> What's it like in that mission field? He, and, that, and the missionary said, well, when it gets that bad, I just go back to the mission field. It is difficult to understand that sometimes if you don't have the courage, especially when you're under, under the gun, when people uh, <clears throat> will judge and criticize and uh, attack you. They had, number five, they had endurance along with that courage to keep at it. Six, they understood that principle in Ephesians chapter 1 that we are not just called to suffer. We are not just called to believe, but to suffer for his sake. They actually experienced suffering because they knew it was part of the package of bringing honor and glory to the Savior. And by the way, that's one of the ways God shows his overwhelming love and momentum in our life by letting us endure suffering, especially when it's suffering for righteousness' sake. Not just because we're stupid or because we make bad decisions. But they understood that true suffering is a compliment to God's grace and glory in heaven. I'm amazed when I get those magazines from the voice of the <clears throat> of the martyrs when I hear the stories that they stand up under great opposition, under watching how the enemy manipulates their circumstances to destroy their life and how much courage it takes and endurance to hang in there. But they realize one of the ways God glorifies himself in our life is to give us these, these tests so that we uh, suffer for his sake, not for hours of the dumb things we do. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Flip is 129. That's the verse. <clears throat> That's number six. Seven. They believed that self-control was a mandate in the ministry. Self-discipline and self-control. 
It's a concept that we not only hear the Word of God, we apply it to our lives. And we respect the fact that we honor the Lord's wisdom and His character and His grace in our life even when things seem to fall apart. Of course, self-discipline, self-control is the fruit of the Spirit. But it's an attitude. I remember a lady one time came to Robert E. Lee and she had her young baby with baby boy, and she said, Mr. Lee, would you put a blessing on this child? He grabbed that little boy in his arms and held him up, and he said, Lady, teach him to deny himself. You don't hear that anymore. But that's a sign of discipline. That's a sign of you have the right kind of fear. It's called reverence. It's called respect. And the eighth thing, you can almost imagine, they were known as people who understood divine love. They loved one another. They loved the people on their mission field. They loved their enemies. And that's just not a good thing to uh, have to deal with sometimes. Unless you're focused on the divine mind of Jesus Christ, who was our example they were known as people who had love in their life. The kind of love that 1 Corinthians 13 talks about. Now, if you'll turn with me, I want to at least give you a perspective on some of this. If you'll turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. In chapter 11, 26 times the word came up, faith, by faith, by means, and what's faith? It's understanding that faith only works because you have the object of faith. It's not the fact that we believe something, it's the fact that we believe something that has to do with his ability to deliver and to motivate and encourage our lives no matter where we end up and what we have to deal with. And chapter 12 is kind of a summary of chapter 11 with a hall of fame of the believers. I'm not going to try to really get in details here because there's something else I want to share with you. <clears throat> but Hebrews chapter 12 starts out, Therefore, you always ask yourself, what's that there for? It's, it's a continuation of the, the, the chapter before and the things that mattered the most in their life and how that they had breakthroughs. To get into that Hall of Fame, every one of them had to go through some real storms. But on the basis of what we just read in chapter 11, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses, and this is referring back to the heroes of faith in chapter 11, it's like a cloud of witnesses. In other words, they seem to be up there while we're trying to run our race looking unto Jesus. We're inspired by how God honored every one of these people in that Hall of Fame of chapter 11. They all got there the same way. They kept trusting Him. Regardless of circumstance, they trusted Him. So He said, so because of this great cloud of witnesses, Surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin. Of course, the sin here is the old sin nature. Encumbrance may not be sin. But you're talking about running a race. So what would you wear if you wanted to run a race? One of the things that we used to do in the second rangers, we had a a, a test, we would go 7.6 miles with full combat. Uh, our canteens were full. We had we had live, live weapon. We carried the, our weapons, and we had to cover 7.6 miles. And then you had five minutes to put your guys in a firing position to hit targets for qualification. And I was so proud that our, our squad and part of our team uh, kind of set the, set the pace. Of course, when we got about five miles down the road, I stopped them, 
opened up my rucksack and I had a big gallon jug of ice cold <clears throat> uh, what, are the, what are all these football players there? Gatorade. Gatorade. We took, uh, what's that? Yo. <laughs> I thought somebody would say, well, what'd you have in there? I had some skid rose, I guess. I don't know what. <laughs> anyway, we, we said it really made a difference too in the guys because we were blowing and going, but. He's talking about running a race here. But laying aside the things, the distractions. There it is. Father, show me the things in my life that distract me from my priorities. And the sin, which is the old sin nature, which is easily entangles us and let us run with hupomeno. Boy, I love that word. Endurance. Never slack off, never quit. The race that is set before us. By the way, we're not here to compete with, with one another. We have a unique race that God has ordained in our life. And if we pursue that, if that's our motivation, if that's why we're alive and we continue to pursue the gifts that God's given us, and having the heart to drive on, no matter what circumstances are around you. The race set before us, fixing our eyes. Does somebody have a different translation? This is the American standard. Focus, fixing our eyes. On Jesus, looking unto him. The word I have here is fixing, focus your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And when you talk about those eight things that I gave you by the heroic, uh, the heroic faith for the believers in harm's way, they understood what this meant right here. They knew that their, their focus was the Lord Jesus. For the joy set before him. Anybody want to guess what the joy was? Huh? You think it might be in reference to us? Huh? The joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and finally sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I want to give you a little outline on this passage if you ever want to teach it, okay? You have the grind of life. The grind. And that's sometimes what's it like to just keep doing the same thing. Keep going where God sent you to go. Please keep communicating on the basis of God's open doors to you. Just keep going. That's called the grind. Next you have the gaze. How do you stay motivated? We look to the coach. We look to the one that inspires us. We're looking unto him. He's our example. You say, yeah, but he was uh, part God, but he never let that become part of his way of uh, running the race. He had greater, he had the joy perspective, which is also the word gaze. He had their eyes fixed. You got the, he's in the grind, the gaze. And what's the goal? What's our ultimate goal? In life. Why, why do we do all this? When it comes right down to the last nit, nit, nitty gritty. Why do we do this? Why do we keep coming and studying? Why do we still look for opportunities to serve him? Because we love him. Of course you have the, the grind. The gaze looking into him. The goal is to finish well. There's another G there, by the way. It's not here, but it's there. The glory. The glory. And he says, I want to be your example so you don't become discouraged. That you don't reach the place where you just want to give up. Uh, I 
I just love this passage because it, it, it gives us the mindset. Now I want to take you over to uh, Luke 10. Because this really encourages me. Jesus just set, set the 72 of his disciples out on mission trips. And when they came back, they were excited. They were very excited. And he told them, he said, you use my name. That was the credit card that they had that caused them to have supernatural power over circumstances and over demons and anything that might attack them. They came back with this glorious report. And the 70 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. He said to them, now you see, here's their mindset. They come back all excited because they experienced his overwhelming power and his presence in the Holy Spirit. Now you're going you're gonna to hear something about his mindset. When they were excited about that, he was talking about something else he was looking at. And he said, verse 18 of Luke 10, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like a lightning. Now this could represent when he was initially kicked out of heaven. Or this could be prophetic knowing in the trib, he's going to lose access to heaven. He's going to take it out on this planet. But they were excited that they had this kind of power. And he said, behold, that's like another barely, barely. That means, listen up. It's a big thing here. I've given you authority to tread upon serpents, scorpions, and all the power of the enemy had nothing shall in injure you. Isn't that the 144,000 in the trib? Aren't they sealed? Can you imagine 144,000 Billy Grahams? You think the Lord's not going to try to give these people a chance to wake up before it's all over? Huh? I don't know about you. I'm just so glad I'm not going to be there. Whew. Nevertheless, verse 20, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits or the demonic sources were subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. When's the last time you felt overwhelmed knowing one thing? I'm saved. I'll never feel the fires of hell. I, will, I, I belong to the royal family. When we stop and write down or learn the, the, the divine operation, divine assets that God's given us to become overcomers. The very fact that we can say, I'm saved. I never get tired of saying, Father, thank you for saving me. Thank you for drawing me to you. You remember I taught something on a Sunday here a few months ago from Second Chronicles where Jehoshaphat was being attacked by a large army and he had the courage to bring all of his people to, up, up near the, the house of God and he began to pray out loud and he said, and I say this in my heart every day, are you not the God of Israel? Are you not the Almighty One? Are you not the powerful source of all good and perfect things? Yes, you are. Did you not? How often do we sit down and think about the weird experiences that we've gone through where God just spared us some hard knocks and used us in spite of ourselves and his faithfulness over and over again? His faithfulness, his character. Did you not? Yes. Are you not first? Did you not? Yes. Will you not? Yes, he will. He said, don't get excited about that. 
rejoice that your that the spirits don't don't rejoice because you had power of the spirits, but rejoice that your name is recorded in heaven. And at that very moment, he rejoiced greatly in the Holy Spirit and said, by the way, he just stopped right there and began to communicate with the Heavenly Father. This is what prayer is all about. It's an ongoing communication with him, no matter where you are. You don't need an opportunity. You don't have to have anybody say, would you lead us in prayer? Everything we're saying, basically, with a good attitude, is coming back to relate to him. Keeping your yippee on, right? Y'all know what a yippee is? Huh? Yeah. My grandson, every morning I'd say, Shane, what day is it? He'd go, this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And then he'd go, yippee. Now I got people all over the country, and they call up and say, Gary, you got your yippee on? I said, I don't take it off. What is the yippee of life? It's the attitude of gratitude. Everything is received with gratitude. Even the bumps. Even the pain. I had somebody we all love and know out of this church that the other night, uh, I guess it was last week, she used the expression, I have Alzheimer's. I have Alzheimer's. And she said it two or three times. And then we got, went to the parking lot, and I stopped and I said, Darling, listen to me. Never put out of your mouth something your body is going to have to listen to. You want to know why some people have Alzheimer's? Because they talk themselves into it. Don't ever buy that. What comes out of our mouth changes everything about the way we live. You talk to people say, I, uh, I never remember names. I wonder why. You just told yourself why you'll never remember names. What comes out of our mouth? And I've learned that the few thoughts that you have early in the morning determines 90 to 95 percent of the kind of day you're going to have. You wake up and say, oh, God, it's morning. I have people tell me, I'm allergic to morning. That's just a bad attitude. That's just a bad attitude. That's what that is. That's justification of your insanity. You wake up and say, good morning, sir. If I should meet you during this whole day, I pray that it brings honor and glory to you. Thanks for saving me. Thanks for America. Thank you that Hillary is not going to make it. <laughs> If I offended anybody, I meant it. <laughs> At that very moment, he began to rejoice greatly in the Holy Spirit and said, I praise thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you hid these things from the wise and the intellects and you revealed them to the babes. That's not the little ones. I think that's the teenagers, right? Is that what that word is? You know why I'm so blessed? I've spent my entire life reaching young people. My entire life. Working with troubled kids. The night that I almost... Took someone's life. I was bitter. I was angry. And I had determined that I'm going to solve one of my problems. I'm going to kill this guy. But I am so aware how God's grace and my guardian angel got involved and restrained me and totally turned my lousy attitude around. I was 19 and that's when I made a statement when I walked back into this place that I had just stepped out of. I said, if you can do that for me, if you can recycle my garbage like you just did, 
you lifted off of me something that I carried for a long time. If you could do that for me, would you please show me how I can teach that to others because I want them to experience what I just experienced, your tremendous deliverance and your grace. And next thing I know, some guy was at, oh, came up there looking for a job and his eyes were so red, looked like he was bloodshot eyes. I go, man, look at your eyes, man. Are you an alcoholic or something? He goes, no. He said, I try to find jobs at night, but he said, I don't sleep a lot. I go to Bible college in the day. And I go, ding. You go, where? Bible college? Where? Oh, it's downtown Miami. It was two blocks from the juvenile hall. And within a week, I was down there knocking on them doors. I wasn't going because I was a good student. I was like W.C. Fields. He was in jail one time with a Bible, and they said, Mr. Fields, we didn't know you were a, uh, you were a believer. He said, I'm not. I'm looking for loopholes. <laughs> that was me. I had this attitude. If this is the real deal, I'm going to sell out. If it's not the real deal, I'm not going to mess with it no more. Because I saw both sides of the coin there. But I finally saw me. And here he is. I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. You hid these things from the wise and you gave them to the, to, to the teens, the youth. Yes, Father, this was well-pleasing in your sight. Boy, that's a mouthful of encouragement in my life. A mouthful of encouragement in my life. Now, I will encourage you all to take that outline, the eight things that I gave you, and, and, and that's a skeleton, and go back in your own frame of reference and find the verses that would fit that, and you can teach that to people. Heroic faith. Because most of the heroes of faith, we pass every day like ships at night. And throw flowers at their funeral. I, I get in schools and say, don't give flowers to dead people. I said, if you're at a funeral, I said, not during the ceremony, but when everybody's gone, get them flowers, find somebody who hadn't had a flower in life, and bless them with a flower. I said that to a kid up in Washington State, that hundreds, well, how long ago was that? 30 years, 40, I don't know. He handed me a piece of paper, and I didn't read it till I was down the, down the road said, I'd rather have a rose from a garden of a friend than flowers do around my casket when my days on earth would end. I'd rather have a hug and smile from a friend I know is true than tears shed around my casket when the world I bid adieu. <clears throat> Give me the flowers today. I don't care if they're yellow, pink, or red. I'd rather have one blossom now than a truckload when I'm dead. I love that. I love that. Now, I want you... Um, I want you to go with me now over to Matthew chapter 11. I'm not going to try to teach this. I'm just going to give it to you. Jesus just finished briefing a lot of his disciples. And according to history, he was probably in some city performing miracles, healing people. And some of uh, John the Baptist's disciples uh, were, were visiting John in the dungeon. And John must have felt pretty low. Because he told them, go find Jesus and ask him one question. Is he the one or do I look for another? We have no idea what he was going through. He had slept under the stars in the desert. He neglected himself. He never had a girlfriend, never had a wife, never had all the, the things of life. He was a rugged warrior, and he, he called it like it was. And now he's about to die. And his cousin, Jesus, he keeps thinking, if you are going to start your kingdom, you are the king. If you're going to set up your kingdom, I, in any minute now, you're going to be, someone's going to come and get me, and I'm going to join you. And you would think if Jesus Christ was your, your, your uh, not just Savior, but he was what the Jews were looking for. He's the promised one. 
And what did Jesus do to, to deliver John from this terrible experience he's about to have? He's going to lose his head over the dance of some little flippy gibbet, some cruel little girl because of the rulership. And he said, go find Jesus and ask him this question. Now, I believe Jesus was probably catching a lot of people at that particular time, but when they came in, he said, send them all away. I've got to sit down and talk to them. When John was in prison and heard the works of Christ, he sent word to his disciples and said, Ask him, Are you the coming one, or shall we look for someone else? And Jesus answered and said, Go, report to John the things which you hear and see. All he had to do was just give it a command, and the prison would be open. Of all the people, and he compliments him here. He said, There's no man on earth equal to John. Gave... And that passage over there in, 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 in uh, Matthew 11, verse 25, is a kind of a reflection of the one I just gave you in Luke 10. He just started praising the Lord. But he said there was none greater than John. But he's not going to lift a finger to deliver him. Go report to him, verse 4. The things which you hear and see... The blind are receiving sight. The lame. The leopards are being cleansed. The deaf are getting hearing. The dead are raised up. The poor have the gospel preached to them. What do you give poor people? Hope. What's, where's the hope? The gospel. If somebody responds to the gospel, your poverty is over. You're a child of the king. But John... It becomes subjective. And we have no right to try to figure it out. We have no idea what this man is going through. And the fact that he's going to be drug out of that pit and beheaded. But I think he asked, it's not here, but I think he asked his disciples when they came back and said, this is what Jesus told us to tell you. And he said, were all the lame healed? No. All the lepers cleansed? No, just, just some that were there. All the deaf here? Can you imagine if you were a mother and you had your, your dear girl born with some defect and you were the next one to step up when Jesus said, send them away. In other words, John finally got this message. Were they all healed? No. Not all of them. Were all the dead raised? No, just a few. Verse 6. Blessed are you who keep from stumbling over me. Out of nowhere, he makes this statement. Do you get it? Huh? What he's saying is, no matter what happens, blessed are those who are not offended do you realize if you submit your life and my life to the King of Kings and we decide to spend our days honoring Him, there's going to be some tough times coming. Some unbearable circumstances. But no matter what it is, you accept it as unto Him without criticism. How often is God Himself being blamed for so much stuff? And yet he's perfect. He's incapable of making a bad decision. thought I'd give you a little bit of where I've been. Number six of the eight things I gave you is their attitude toward undeserved suffering. Right? I don't, I'm going to be very careful not to give you too much detail, but if you know anything about this, you might understand. When my ministries first got kicked in and I started doing schools in Texas, I had a test. Ron may remember it. I, I was being uh, accused by, by somebody who I not only love, I would have died for. 
all of a sudden I got falsely accused and uh, I had no idea it was coming. It was a real test. By the way, it was passed around the country. Some of the people that you know here possibly were involved with. with it was the determination to shut me down. Just when it started, this test came to me. And I was there. Years later, I came back and I sat in front of this individual. And all of a sudden, I'm there, and this other gentleman with me said, Gary, tell him the Bum Phillips story. How many of you know what that is? Tell him the Bum Phillips story. Years ago, when I was ready to do a high school in Nederland, Texas, out there by Beaumont, I had this fine gentleman, and he said, uh, Gary, I'm taking you to this school. This school is going to hear you today. And on the way over, they said, let me tell you something. Years ago, I played on this football team. And Coach Bum Phillips was our high school coach. He later went on to the NFL, and some of you know his, his career. Well, I'm sitting in front of this, the, the, the conflict, so to speak. I'm sitting around the person who probably did all he could to kind of destroy me. And all of a sudden, somebody there says, Gary, tell him about the Bum Phillips story. I said, he goes, yeah, I want to hear it. I said, when I went to that school, the guy that took me played on that football team. And Bum Phillips was his high school football coach. And he said, one day there was a situation in the hall when all of a sudden in the classroom, the, the, the English teacher looked at the star running back, Mr. Personality, and she said, by the way, I don't cheer for some of you simply because you can run up down a football field. She said, I look at your grades, I look at your attitude, and if I happened to be your coach, you wouldn't be playing for this high school. I mean, she gave him what he deserved. When he got out of the class, he couldn't wait to tell his other buddy what he thought of this teacher. And he was cruel with his words. The other guy said, look, uh, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to play your game. You deserve what she said. And you forgot, I warned you one day, you, it's going to catch up with you. I agree with her, and you say one more bad thing, I'm going to drop you like a, like a hot tomato. And all of a sudden, Coach Phillips hears the conversation in the hall between two of the football players. And he comes out of that class and grabs his kid, and he says, you get down to my office now. By the way, his office was down from the main hall of the high school, and every time Bum Phillips got the Board of Education going, it echoed through the whole school. And it had holes in it. They asked him, Coach, why you got holes in the paddle? He said, that's cut through all the bureaucracy the teachers got to mess with. And the most he ever whipped a kid, and Bum Phillips was about 6'6", six, six, weighed about two plenty. When he put it on you, you knew it. The most he ever gave a guy was five whacks. He hit this kid ten times so loud it just echoed through the halls and the whole school is just sitting there going, oh. When he was through, he said, football is a game. But respect for authority is your life, son. If you don't learn it now, you never will. If your dad's got any question, tell him to come and see me. Kid left. Nothing was said. No big deal. Until 20 years later, when they had a student class reunion, that's when we all try to come back and look young again. They asked Coach Phillips, who's now with the Houston Oilers, would he come and, and, and address the team a 20-year reunion? And he showed up that night, and prior to the banquet, they were talking about good old days and what's it like in the NFL. And One guy said, Coach, you remember 20 years ago the guy you wailed with that paddle? He said, yeah, I remember that. Did you ever find out you whipped the wrong kid? He said, what? You didn't get the troublemaker. You grabbed the, his buddy. Well, how come somebody didn't tell me? How come I had to wait 20 years to find out that I did this to, to the wrong kid? 
He said, Coach, we would have told you, but he stayed in the locker room after you left that night and made us, every one of us, promise never to tell you. He said he didn't want you to know. So he's standing there now, a little on the embarrass, embarrassment side, and he says, are you here now? The guy stepped up and said, I'm right here, Coach. Why didn't you say something? Why didn't you stop me? He said, sir, you weren't in the listening mood at that particular time. But that's not the issue. Coach, that's the best thing anybody ever gave me in high school. You know what I learned that day? If I can take it when I don't deserve it, I can take it when I do. He said, the only regret I have now, I wish you'd have given some of that to every guy on the team because they would have needed it in life. Unless you're in that kind of environment, unless life hits you when you know your name's not on that, but because you have the poise to say, what's the issue here? What's the issue here? What's behind all of this? How rare that young man was. And when I told that story, the individual who had uh, accused me of a few things looked at me. And it was over. It was over. I, 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 it had to be God because I wouldn't have volunteered to tell that story if a friend of mine sitting there also said, he wants to hear the story, Bum Phillips story. I have had the privilege of using that story all over the country because until you've been where I've been, until you've been where a lot of people have been and you get accused of stuff that you know had nothing to do with you, but you have a choice. You know how I finally passed the test? Not only did I just move to Alabama because that man there wanted one week a month of my time. And bless old Sylvia. She started knocking on doors. Amazing. <clears throat> but I look back at it, and you want to know how I passed the test? I realize I'm not... I'm not important enough to take it personal. When you take it personal, it's called subjectivity. It's objectivity gives you the victory. Okay, what is this all about? How can I use this in my life? God must have allowed this to happen. Now, how am I going to do with it? I'm going to, I'm going to trust him with it. I'm here to tell you, that's the only way to live. This world's cruel. And if you're squared away biblically, if you, if you care about what's in this Bible and that man's life back there and you're going to be faithful to sit and listen, the enemy is upset with you. By the way, he's upset with Trump. There are people out there right now who would love to blow this man away. Pray for the wall of fire to keep him safe. Thanks for sitting here tonight with me. Thanks for showing up. You are friends forever. And I'm glad I know you. Heavenly Father, I'm so impressed how that you take all the garbage of this world and make it turn around and make it good for us when things are not good. But the victory is faith. You've already taught us that. Without it, we can't please you. We have to just trust in your character and in your word because when you come back on that white horse with blood dripping and they look at you and your name is written, the word of God, that's where you live. And we have it in our hands. I want you to bless this church. I want you to bless the leadership. Mama Jane. Steve back here. I'm so proud of him. He's not happy. He's not comfortable sitting here listening to me, but he has trusted you. I want you to honor that faith and that trust. These other families here who pray for me, the people who care and been there to encourage me over the years, I am indebted to this family. Thank you, Father. Bless this, uh, these words. Sanctify it all in the name of Jesus Christ.